Hello, and welcome to week two's video lecture. This week we are going to be diving into code 2.0, which is behavior analyst responsibility to clients. So first of all, we want to define our terms. What do we mean when we say clients? According to the code, a client is anyone who is receiving services. It could also be the parent or guardian of a service recipient. It could be an organizational representative if you're providing services to an organization or the public private organization as a whole. So as we go through the different portions of the code, I am going to prevent, present a summary here on the PowerPoint slides, as you can see. It may be helpful for you to have either a printed or digital copy of the code so you can follow along. I am not going to quote the code's text um, completely or exhaustively here on the slides. Obviously, you can do that without me. So what I'm going to do is um, provide a visual and verbal summary of each section of the code. But I do think it's important for you to um, actually walk through the code step by step as well. OK, so 2.01 is accepting clients. This is important because it gives us some guidelines on what we need to consider before accepting a specific client. So some of the uh, factors in this decision are our level of education, our training on the job experience uh, and experience, our available resources, what do we have access to in our organization or in our community, and the organizational policies. So if you do not have sufficient competence um, and should not accept a client, you have two options. You can either express that and decline to take on that client, or you can seek the supervision of a BCBA who is competent and has the, um, the available resources, education, training to um, be able to work effectively with that individual. I think when we think about are we competent to accept a client, whether or not we accept a client, we often think about education, training, and experience. You know, do I know how to work with a client who has these issues? You know, we the field of behavior analysis is very broad. We can work with anyone with the principles of ABA, but working with a teen with an eating disorder is very different than working with a nonverbal preschool student with self-injurious behavior, is very different than working um, with, you know, uh, training a caregiver in a group home, for instance. I mean, that's just a handful of the wide variety and sample of what we encounter in our field. So we often think about those education training experience, but I don't think as many people consider the final two of the five, which is available resources and organizational policies. Specifically, I think it's important to think about organizational policies uh, in the sense that, let's say there's a client who um, has uh, very little generalization skills. Um, you review the records, you interview, you find out that they can learn skills in isolated environments and it doesn't generalize and they've already received intensive instruction in clinic and one-on-one -on -one, and the problem is that they're not generalizing those skills. Well, if in your position and your organization dictates that you are only able to provide one-on-one -on -one services in clinic, well, then you might need to say, mm, I don't think that I would be appropriate for this client because my organizational policies in my role limit me in my ability to help with generalization in the home or community. Another example would be if um, your organizational policies prohibit you from having any um, physical contact with clients, and this is somewhat common, 
If you have a individual who um, is a very early learner or has some significant problem behavior, and you will need to do some physical prompting um, and or some safety restraint or anything like that that involves physical contact, you want to really look at, yes, you may have the education training and experience and you know what they need, but will your organization and in your role, will you be able to do everything that you need to do for that client? So that's a, I believe that's an important consideration. The big takeaway here, um, and as we go along, I'll kind of have the, uh, the big bold red at the bottom is kind of my, you know, takeaways from this. It's that being certified and licensed as a BCBA LBA does not make you competent to deal with all situations or behaviors. I'm sure you guys know this, um, but I don't think that everybody else knows this because we are. We don't have BCBA hyphen autism, BCBA hyphen, you know, self-injurious behavior. I mean, we're just, BCBA is a BCBA, so people might expect you to do whatever comes your way. It's behavior, you're a behavior analyst. Um, but you need to explain to everyone, especially your supervisors, that, look, these are my areas of competence, even though it may be dealing with the principles of ABA, if it's outside of these areas, um, I'm not ethically able to um, accept those clients. Okay, so um, 2.02 .02 responsibility. You are responsible for all parties affected by behavior analytics services. So if there are multiple parties, you need to establish a hierarchy of beneficiaries right at the beginning of services. And the ultimate beneficiary must be identified and the services must be in their best interest. You know, if you're working for um, an agency and the agency is funded by another agency like the Department of Mental Health and you're going in to train um, the staff at a group home and there are parents and guardians of the clients and of course the individuals in that group home we're looking at you know the individuals their parents and guardians the staff at that group home your employer and then the funding agency so there's a lot of a lot of different people involved that's just one example um, same if you come in to do a school consultation you have your employer if there's a different funding agency you've got the school and you have the teachers, the paraeducators, the students, and the students' families. And so you need to figure out at the beginning, okay, who am I there? Who is the ultimate beneficiary? Um, and what is going to be done in their best interest? If you're consulting on a student or, you know, providing services to a student in a school, that's different than if the school hires you to train their staff. Um, sometimes there's overlap there, but um, it's not always so cut and dry. So... Takeaway here, are you working to make things better for your employer, the organization, or the client, the individual? Um, this can often be a frequent area of conflict because <clears throat> ideally we want it to be in the best interest of everyone, and that's often the case. But sometimes those do come in to conflict. So if an organization wants you to, um, we've got a disruptive student or individual in a group home, you're hired by the group home. Um, they really want you to decrease the vocalizations of this individual because it's really, um, you know, annoying for lack of a better term for staff or disruptive to other clients. Then is that in the best interest of the client? And who is your ultimate, ultimate beneficiary? Well, maybe they're a um, hearing impaired and they're working on some vocal mans and so we don't want to necessarily it would not be in the individual's best interest to extinguish that verbal behavior because it's a step along in shaping them to um, become more independent and acquire more communication skills but it is um, in the best interest of the organization because they're um, being disrupted by this individual's behavior. So there's some complicated situations and you wanna make sure that you know who you're really there for. Okay, so 2.03 consultation. <clears throat> there's two parts of this code. Um, first part is arranging for appropriate consultations and referrals based on the best interests of the client. 
Second part is cooperate with other professionals as appropriate and in line with the philosophical assumptions of behavior analysis. So this is a common one. Um, what do you do when you're asked for a referral by a parent for massage therapy, music therapy, sensory integration, or another provider who, you, um, who is not evidence-based? I am sure that you will come across this. Um, you know, there's different levels. A parent may say, hey, will you, I really want you to write a letter saying that they need music therapy for insurance or for another funding agency. How do you approach that? Um, you know, kind of a different situation would be what if you're in a team meeting and you, you have a occupational therapist and a music therapist and massage therapist and, you know, all these around the table. Well, you do need to cooperate with other professionals as appropriate, but um, is it in line with the philosophical assumptions of behavior analysis? Probably not. Um, and so this section of the code allows you to guide your consultation and cooperations in that it has to be, you don't cooperate at all times, it has to be in line with the philosophical assumptions of behavior analysis. So you can point to this and say, look, I'm not able to, um, you know, necessarily work with you on this service because it's not in line with the philosophical assumptions of behavior analysis. Okay, so third party involvement in services. Um, there are four sections to this. Um, first of which is the top left, uh, clarify nat nature of relationships at the outset to prevent future occurrences of conflicts. So this is very important. This is a preventative piece that I spoke about last week. Last week, You really want to be clear about what your role is and what the role of any other third party involvement is at the beginning. Who are you there to serve? Second part is, if there's a foreseeable risk, be sure to clarify the nature and direction of responsibilities and resolve in accordance with the code. So. At the beginning, if you have, you know, a group home telling you, I really, we really need this individual to be quiet, and then you find out that that client is, you know, to use the same examples before, um, hearing impaired and is in, you know, language therapy, developing some manding vocaliz vocalizing, well, you're going to see right at the beginning <clears throat> that there's a conflict and then you need to make it clear, am I here to train staff on how to shape this behavior in a more appropriate way? Or am I here to serve the client and to improve their quality of life? Um, and you need to make that decision at the beginning so you're not part of the way into um, providing services when these things come to a head. So you need to make those decisions as soon as possible and clearly communicate that to everyone involved. Um, the third one, bottom left, if services are given to minors or protected classes, then the parent guardian must be fully informed. I think you guys would know that. Um, if we're working with an individual who is not their own legal guardian, either due to age or because of um, a court action, then all services must be uh, discussed with their guardian. Bottom right, the fourth one, if third party uh, requires services that are not in the best interest of the client, then this must be resolved or service, services terminated after appropriate transition. So you do your best. You have um, two parties that are not in agreement as to what needs to happen. You try to resolve it. If not, you need to terminate it and to find someone else to appropriately transition into that. So, um, you know, this is one of those areas that um, it doesn't give really, really specific as far as how long do you try to resolve it before you terminate, um, you know, what is appropriate transition to another service provider. Um, that is where your ethical judgment comes in. And that's what we're here to discuss. So it doesn't spell out all the details, but it does give you the guidance that if it's, if you're not seeing progress in the resolution of these, then you, it is your obligation to terminate services.
Okay, so 2.05, write some prerogatives of clients. Um, the important one here is right up top here, A, the client's rights are dominant. You must provide support at all times. So that individual receiving services, that client, again, client, we discussed earlier what that means, um, those rights are first and foremost. Um, other rights and things you need to keep in mind, you have to um, provide your credentials upon request. Uh, in my experience, after all that we have to go through to get certified and licensed in the state, I am very happy to provide my credentials to clients. Um, but just make sure that's something that you um, make a habit of doing and have available. C is consent from client and staff for recording. Um, again, just because you're working with them doesn't mean that you can necessarily video record without a separate consent. And most organizations have a policy for that. And if it's a different type, if it's audio, video, um, if you're um, quoting them for some reason, you just want separate consent for each type. And that's um, that's pretty common practice for most organizations. Um, D is informing of rights of complaint procedures. Um, you can find those on the BACB website. Um, this is an important thing to do during intake for services. Most organizations have a kind of a protocol for that and like a packet where it says here's my credentials or how to get them. Um, here's different consents and maybe you want to go ahead and get video consent at the get-go even if you're not 100% sure you're going to get video. And then also you want to provide them with their rights and complaint procedures right from the beginning because they may not feel comfortable asking you for those. Um, and we just want to be proactive and say if you ever have any problem, of course come to me, but you're also welcome to um, complain through these um, mechanisms, through the um, Behavior Analysis Certification Board. And then also you're going to comply with criminal background checks, and that is, <clears throat> excuse me, best practice for um, most organizations. Um, and obviously if you have any criminal history, that's going to affect your ability to get certified. But um, also, you know, if you're working with implementers and others, you want to make sure that everybody has um, a criminal background check completed, and that helps protect the rights of clients. Okay, so 2.06, maintaining confidentiality. Um, confidentiality is a priority and is legally mandated by state and federal regulations. Um, you know, they don't go into all the detailed regulations um, in the ethical code because HIPAA, FERPA, IDEA, and different, um, you're going to be under one of those other um, privacy acts. So in the education world, we're typically under FERPA, which is Family Educational Rights Protection Act, and or IDEA, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. If you're providing services under the medical model, um, then you're going to be under HIPAA, the Health Information Privacy Act and Protection Act. So those regulations um, go into the nitty gritty of what is compliant, what isn't, what this is telling you is that you have to follow those, one of those regulations, depending on what field you're in. So again, you want to um, discuss the confidentiality at the outset of the relationship. So this is a great thing to do during that intake meeting with family and the client and uh, any third party and saying that these are what regulations I follow. Um, you don't, you got to have this at the outset, not later on. Um, the next one is providing only information that is relevant to the behavior analytic work and all correspondence to minimize privacy intrusions. So when you're communicating with other providers, um, you want to make sure that you are only providing information on a need to know basis. There's no need to provide any information that isn't pertinent to the specific purpose of the communication. And that's pretty, I hope, common sense. Uh, next one is only discussing cases with colleagues for appropriate professional scientific purposes. Um, appropriate professional purposes is um, a little bit vague, some room for um, interpretation, but I think it's pretty clear that I don't think anybody could justify appropriate professional purpose being to complain, to vent, to tell a funny story. I think we've all had those situations where 
we have classmates, employers, colleagues that we want to talk to. We just want to share what happened in our day, right? Um, we see a lot of really, this is a, an interesting field. I, I could, you know, go on all day with stories um, of things that I've seen from clients, families, and in situations. Um, that's one of the things that I love about this field is it's never a dull moment. There's always something interesting. But we have to maintain the confidentiality of our clients. And that means we don't go and tell every funny story or complain about how frustrating a client or family is. We have to maintain confidentiality, <clears throat> confidentiality and only discuss if um, professionally appropriate. And last one, I hope this is common sense, but I know that common sense isn't so common for a lot of people when it comes to social media, but do not share anything about clients on social, social media. Um, I'm sure you guys are good about this, and um, I'm sure this has been talked about um, in clients. I think, I think the generation of service providers who are coming uh, into the field now, including you all, are much more social media savvy than some people who came to technology later and don't quite understand the etiquette and implications of social media. So um, I trust that you guys understand the implications of posting something about a client on social media, but unfortunately a lot of people don't. So one thing to keep in mind is um, you're going to be posting in the forum. So you're going to be maintaining confidentiality and practicing this as you post. So you're going to talk about situations, you know, as professionally and scientifically appropriate. And that's great. That's what we're going to do in several of our forums. But you do not need to disclose any personally identifying information. In fact, that will affect your ability to get points for that post, um, not to mention be an ethical violation and any unnecessary background information. Now, if you're posting and saying that, you know, you received a, a gift from this family and they wouldn't refuse, and then you say that they are of um, maybe uh, some ethnic um, heritage that is um, outside of North America, then that, that could be relevant information because uh, cultural factors come into that. Um, you could also say that, you know, they are low socioeconomic status, and therefore that leads to, you see that they're, um, maybe the child's not getting three meals a day or something. So in that case, you know, that background information is relevant. So it's not that you can't give some background information. It just needs to be relevant to the case. Um, and, you know, personally identifying information, you want to be careful, not, not first names, not that they you know, go to this church, you just want to provide minimal clues so that somebody who is from your community couldn't guess who it is. Um, I use the example, like you don't have to give any names or numbers or anything, but if you say, oh, um, a third grade set of twins with autism um, who are African American at my school in Kansas City, well, very likely somebody in Kansas City there's probably not too many second grade African-American twins with autism, for example. And even though you didn't give any names or anything like that, you gave enough clues that could lead to their identification. Okay. All right, so maintaining records. Um, we want to maintain confidentiality with appropriate record keeping practices. Um, and this is the same for physical as electronic. And we want to maintain and dispose of all records in accordance with local laws and organizational policies. It reads simply, but uh, maintaining confidentiality with record keeping practices is not as easy as it sounds. Um, for example, I, I get into a lot of situations where different organizations have different standards for confidentiality. So it's just a email through Gmail? Is that a secure method for sharing client information? What about Skyping or FaceTime or VC? What about faxing? Um, you know, when you fax a lot of times, it just prints out and sits there in an office for anyone to see. What about leaving files on your desk? 
Um, what if you put them in a drawer? Does the drawer need to be locked? Um, how does your organization deal with these? Every organization should have some policies and follow one of the privacy acts, but you need to be able to answer all these questions for your agency. Um, so if somebody asks, you know, can I fax you this? Can I email? Does it need to be a, a encrypted email? Um, you really need to be aware of those at the outset. You don't want to be caught in a situation where you find out six months in that, oh, you have been violating the confidentiality by keeping records in an unlocked drawer, for instance. Um, and, you know, and if you're providing services in the home and you're driving around a lot and you have them in your car, you know, what extra steps do you need to take for that? I mean, there's a lot of situations that um, you need to be aware of. And that's going to vary based on what field you're in. Again, if you're in an educational or um, medical model and where you're working. Okay, 2.08 disclosures. So this is talking about when can information be disclosed about a client without the client's permission. Now, if the client gives permission, you know, in writing, you can obviously disclose anything that they give you permission for, but without getting a disclosure, um, you can um, disclose information for one, providing needed professional services, two, to obtain appropriate professional consultation, three, to protect client or others from harm, and four, to obtain payment. But to obtain payment, it's going to be very limited basic information. You're not going to need to give a whole lot, most likely, in order to receive payment. So um, one and two, you know, those are just things through the professional, um, uh, through your work, you know, if you need to consult with a colleague or something, you want to disclose as little information as possible, but you might need to discuss the case in order to provide um, necessary services and uh, consult with others. Number three um, is more about being a mandated reporter of abuse and neglect. So you don't have a disclosure from the family, but if you have reason to believe there is abuse or neglect going on, then you are allowed to disclose to the appropriate agencies. Um, that's an important one. Not only are you allowed, you are legally mandated to do so. And not doing so would be an ethical violation. And again, obtaining payment, um, it depends on who you're seeking payment from. Uh, some insurance companies may require, for example, an FBA to justify your provision of services. I, I don't want to give you any guidelines on that because um, you may want to get a um, permission to disclose more detailed information like that. But <clears throat> if it's just, you know, you're sending a bill, you can send a bill saying I'm X number of hours of this to somebody. So that's disclosing some information. You're saying that you provided a certain amount of hours to this individual to a funding agency, but that would be pretty minimal and that's covered. Um, that's compliant under the code. 2.09 deals with treatment and intervention efficacy. According to this section of the code, clients have the right to effective treatment. They go on to define effective as based on research literature, scientifically supported, most effective in terms of both short-term and long-term benefits. So it's important to note here that the clients have a right to treatment that is effective that is different than the right to the treatment of their choice. Now they may, they do have the legal right to seek the treatment of their choice, but we are not legally or ethically mandated to provide them that they would seek that elsewhere. So I often use the example of uh, dolphin assisted communication therapy, which is actually a thing, or one of the other many alternative treatments such as the intensive um, vitamins or nutritional or um, some of the more bizarre treatments out there, they may have the legal right to seek the treatment of their choice, but we do not have the responsibility to provide that. We are just mandated to provide them effective treatment. 
And again, that has to be supported by the scientific research literature. So continuing with uh, 2.09, this section goes on to state that behavior analysts have the responsibility to advocate for the appropriate amount and level of services. This is important because it's saying that not only should we, but we, it's our responsibility to do everything we can so that clients don't just get ABA services, but they get the l amount that they need and the level they need. Um, so if an individual is experiencing some really significant problem behaviors and self-injury, just having an implementer in the house for a couple hours is not going to be an appropriate amount and level of services um, because they're going to need to have uh, someone with more experience and uh, and training in the home. So we have to advocate, and that looks different in different settings. Um, I find myself doing this in IEP meetings quite often and with the administration of our school district to provide what I feel is necessary. It could take the take place in plan meetings. It could be um, with insurance companies, but it is our responsibility to advocate to the best of our abilities that they get the appropriate services at the level that they need. Um, and again, this is where your soft skills come in, your skills and clout. Um, are you an effective advocate? Um, we're not taught how to advocate uh, in our behavior analytic training. We're taught what might be necessary, but not how to effectively advocate for that. So that's where some of those soft skills come in. Section C states that when more than one scientifically supported uh, treatment has been identified, other factors can be considered. So the client's choice, obviously, uh, cost effectiveness, side effects, risk, and provider training and experience. So if they're both scientifically supported, then we can have some level of choice and the client can pick, but only if there's more than one scientifically supported treatment. Section D, uh, behavior analysts review and appraise the effects of any treatments about which they are aware that might impact the goals. So if we're aware that a client is receiving facilitated communication hours, or um, especially this is common in medication, if they're on a medication that is prescribed for the purpose of uh, helping to improve behavior, then we need to incorporate that in our data collection. So we'd have, for example, a phase change line that would document when they started a medication. Okay, so 2.10, documenting professional work and research. Uh, behavior analysts must uh, document work in order to improve the future provision of services by yourself, ensure accountability, and meet legal requirements. So we need to document what we're doing because that makes us accountable and it will help us to look back and determine how we could have improved services in the future. Um, behavior analysts also must create and maintain documentation in the kind of detail and quality that is required by law and best practice. So you need to write down, document what you are doing so that if you are gone tomorrow, God forbid, for whatever reason, someone else could come in and pick up right where you left off. I know that a lot of people um, keep what is happening in their head and they're very good about continuing that and they don't necessarily document everything they're doing. Well, if something terrible were to happen or if you just had to drop everything for some reason and um, discontinue services unexpectedly, would somebody else be able to pick up where you left off and continue on or would it take several months for them to figure out what you were kind of holding in your head to do. And that's just a question you need to ask as far as what are you writing down. If you're trying new things and just trialing different interventions, that's great. Just make sure that's documented and accessible. Okay, 2.11 is pretty brief. Uh, behavior analysts need to create, maintain, disseminate, and dispose of records in accordance with laws. And again, in a manner that allows for appropriate transition of services um, and oversight at any moment in time. So again, that is just 
you need to have those records so that at any point somebody else could come in and hit the ground running with the provision of those services. Section B states that behavior analysts must retain records and data for at least seven years. So um, this is a rare time when it's very specific as far as it's not as appropriate. It is seven years and that is a minimum. Um, there's really little risk in keeping it longer than that unless you're legally obligated to um, dispose of those records. Uh, this also, seven years is how long you need to maintain your supervision documentation. Keep that in mind um, in case you were to be audited, you need to have that accessible for seven years. Hopefully with digital data collection becoming more common, that's going to be easier. But there are risks if you have it saved on your computer and your computer um, explodes one day, which happens, um, do you have those backed up? That is that is your professional responsibility to, to have. Okay, 2.12 deals with contracts, fees, and financial arrangements. Excuse me, 2.12 deals with contracts, fees, and financial arrangements. Section A states that behavior analysts must ensure there is a signed contract in place outlining the responsibility and adherence to the code. For example, when there's a supervisory relationship, there is a sample contract provided on the BACB website that outlines all the necessary parts that you can just edit as necessary. But anytime you have a contract, you have to state in there that you are going to adhere to the code. So not only do you have to adhere to the code, but you have to have a contract stating that you adhere to the code. Part B, as soon as possible, the behavior analyst should reach an agreement on payment amount and timing. So this is a big takeaway here. Um, you know, bringing up payment is, for me, the most uncomfortable part of provision of services. But it has to be discussed as early as possible. Just because you don't enjoy it, don't put it off. Because that is ethically irresponsible. You do not want to establish any relationship, and I mean that in the most general terms, with a client before giving payment information. So for example, if somebody comes to you and says, oh, I could use, I could really use you to come in and help my son, and you ask a bunch of questions, and the parent opens up to you, you give some of your background and just a few ideas, and you guys sit and talk for an hour, and the parent feels like, oh my goodness, I finally have somebody who understands. I'm really excited about this. And then you email a week later with your professional rate, and it is way out of bounds of that family to afford. That was ethically irresponsible because you led them to believe that, or did not lead them to believe, you did not give them all the information. So. If you would have said at the beginning, my rate is $100 an hour, they would have said, oh, thanks for your time, but I'm gonna have to look elsewhere. But if you establish some of that relationship and get them bought in, kind of almost selling them that you're the right person for that, even though it's not intentionally selling, just by the nature of you discussing it, then that is going to put more pressure potentially on that family to spend more than they're able to so it's almost like giving a free trial, like I'll come in once and work and then I'll tell you, disclose my rate. That's not, uh, that's not fair. That's not clear. So really at the beginning, it's like before you go any further, I need to tell you that um, my professional rate is this much per hour, so on and so forth. Um, I just want you to know that before we discuss any services further. That's the professional way to do it. Just say, I'm going to put it out there now. And if they're okay with it, great, keep going. And if not, you didn't waste any of their time or try to um, per persuade them for any services for which they are not financially able to pay. Okay, so section C, um, behavior analyst fees are consistent with the law and are not misrepresented. Um, if services may be limited due to lack of funds, it should be discussed as soon as possible. This is important for individuals who have budgets as a part of some of their state funding um, or also if you say that you know you're going to 
do hourly unless there's an increase and you might have to increase the number of hours if there's you know the data warrants that well if parents are in a fixed income and they can't increase the number of hours that would um, limit services due to a lack of funds then you need to discuss that contingency early on okay so D uh, when funding circumstances change this must be discussed with clients as soon as possible so if they hit their insurance cap or expend all their budget for state funding um, so on and so forth you just got to be as upfront and discuss that with clients as soon as possible okay so 213 accuracy and billing reports it's pretty straightforward but um, you must accurately state the nature of services fees and charges the provider outcomes and other descriptive data so you want to say what you're doing, how much you were doing it, and what came out of it. What's the data that you're taking? And I just put here, billing is not fun, and I, I don't know anyone who gets in the field of ABA or really education or social services in general because they enjoy it, but it needs to be detailed and accurate. Just because you don't enjoy it and it's money isn't why you got in this field, you are ethically obligated to deal with the billing part in a comprehensive fashion. Okay, so 214, referrals and fees. Behavior analysts must not receive or provide any money, gifts, or enticements for referrals. Okay, so all referrals should include multiple options, and they should be made, made based on objective determination of the client's needs and the alignment with the repertoire of the referee. So it should be based on what does the client need and who has the ability to meet these needs. When providing or receiving a referral, if there's any relationship between the referring party and the referee, that must be disclosed. So for this, for example, I mean, in general, any agreement between two friends, um, you know, two providers, to refer to each other um, with the goal of increasing the number of clients for each one is prohibited by this code and could have some serious implications, including loss of certification or licensure. If you and a friend do refer to one another, which will happen because you, you know, colleagues in a community or probably will have some relationship and maybe friends and that's okay. Um, but if you refer to a friend, a family member, or a business partner, that needs to be one of several options, and you need to have it there in writing and, and explained that, you know, here's three people that I think would be able to provide this. I think they're all three able to do it, but this person is somebody who I have a, a, a friendship with, who I'm related to, who I have a business arrangement with, something like that. That has to be disclosed. Um, and it doesn't mean that just because you're friends with somebody, you can't refer them, but it just needs to be one of many options and everyone needs to be clear that you are friends or have some sort of financial arrangement. Maybe you do partner on some cases. If there's any financial business ties, that has to be disclosed. Okay, so the last section of Code 2.0 is 215, Interrupting or Discontinuing Services. We have five parts to this. Um, the first part is that obviously we're going to avoid interruptions and disruptions of services when at all possible. We want things to keep going smoothly so that our clients can make progress. Part B, behavior analysts make reasonable and timely efforts to facilitate the continuation of services if there's unexpected events. So things happen. You may get in an accident, you may be ill, you may have to relocate. Um, you know, family issues, when that happens, you need to make reasonable and timely eff efforts to make sure that services are continued with someone else. Part C, when entering a contract, you always need to include in that contract how services will be transferred upon termination. So if you have a 30-day termination clause or if you have an endpoint, you know, this could be for one year, you have to detail how are you are going to continue services. Are you going to make a referral? Do you already have a referral in place? Spell that out in detail. Part D, 
Discontinuation of services occurs only after efforts to transition have been made. So you do not continue discontinue unless you've made some effort to transition them to another provider. Now you can discontinue if the client doesn't need the services, the client isn't benefiting from the services, the client is being harmed by continuing services, or if the client requests a discontinuation of services. So the very last section here, part E, um, the behavior analysts do not abandon clients and supervisees. That is the wording directly from the code. Um, it does go into a little more detail, but I like that frank language. Do not abandon them. That really summarizes 215 altogether. You might have to discontinue, interrupt, disrupt services, but do not abandon them. Make sure that they're passed on appropriately. Okay, well, that's all we have for this week for Code 2.0. Thank you so much for your time and patience and attention. Next week, we're going to be discussing, discussing Code 3.0 um, because that is a little bit more brief and limited in its scope. That's only going to be one week. So next week is going to be kind of condensed. We're going to discuss the code and have a quiz on it um, as opposed to spreading that out to two weeks as we're doing with other sections of the code. This week you have a quiz on code 2.0. Um, it's going to be a combination of true, false, short answer. It will be brief, but you do need to be familiar with the code. So you want to have um, watched this lecture, reviewed the writing before attempting that quiz. All right. Thank you so much. And I'll see you next week.